She's a live music photographer, a tour photographer. She photographs covers for novels, and now she can add a new feather to her cap. It's Christy Goodwin, and she is a published author on this episode of Behind the Shot. Hi, once again, this is Behind the Shot, the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots, from conception to completion and all the stories and challenges that happen in between. I'm your host, Steve Brazel. As always, if you would drop by iTunes and leave us a review and a rating, it really helps with discoverability. And be sure to check out the website for the podcast. It's behindtheshot.tv. And there you'll find a blog post associated with this episode. You'll find a gallery in that blog post of today's guest's images, so you get a better idea of how they, they shoot. And as well, all the links and everything you need to do to follow that person and give our guest today some love. So I need to do a little intro on today that that's slightly different than what I normally do. When I first started the Behind the Shot podcast back in 2016, I hadn't even launched yet. And I'm a live music photographer. And I always said, this is not going to just be a live music podcast, but I'll have some on, but it's for everybody. But deep down, I'm a live music photographer, right? I love live music photography. And there were a number of people that I followed online, this person being one, and I reached out to her to ask her if she would be on the show. I didn't know her at the time, and she agreed. She was episode number three with a fantastic Katy Perry image called Fireworks. And seriously, go back and watch the episode. And that was, like I say, 2016, before I'd even launched. I am honored to say that since that time, I have become friends with this young lady and her partner, Patrick. I would like to welcome my friend, Christy Goodwin, to the show. How are you, dear? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for having me again. Oh, believe me, it's my pleasure. When when I first started live music photography, like I say, there were a handful of people I followed. It was you, and it was Toddy Young, and my buddy Adam L. Macias, and Anthony Dangio, who we both know now too. Uh, Matthias Hombauer, you were just on Matthias's podcast. And you know, it's funny because when, when I was on Matthias's podcast, I think I was episode five, I don't know the number you were on. Great podcast, by the way, if you're into live music photography, check out Matthias Hombauer's podcast, uh, How to Become a Rockstar Photographer. And he asks all his guests a question of what makes a great live music photo? Your Katy Perry shot has always kind of been my go-to because it was pressure, it was timing, it was the odds were 90% you wouldn't get the shot, right? I mean, that's right. That's kind of what live music photography is. So let's kind of give a background on you. You've been doing this for more than a year. Um, <laughs> being generous, obviously. You, you've been in so this fine. field for so well fine. over a, a, a number of decades, 35 plus years. Um, you have a bachelor degree in, in art photography. Now that one is interesting to me because I hear people debate today. Do you need formal education in photography? What's your thought on that? I think it helps. Um, to this day, actually the things I learned way back still help me in dire situations. Um, when all the odds are against you and you just have to work with what you get. It's often little principles that I was taught back then that I actually implement and then succeed to take the picture. So for me, is it necessary? Probably not because a lot of people make a good business without a degree, but for me, it helps. It's, it's, it's my backbone. Yeah. It's my and goal. I totally agree with you on that. And you said you said one thing that I find interesting, and that is you draw on some of that stuff when there's issues, right? When when mm -hmm. the complications hit, that's when mm -hmm. you need that muscle memory to mm -hmm. kind of kick in. But you mm -hmm. weren't always – some of that muscle memory for you isn't music photography because you started in fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, you started in fine art. You went into editorial news and wire agency stuff. It wasn't until 2005, actually, that you shot your first music gig. And now, the, I describe you the same way every time, and it's probably kind of insane, but you're the, you're the official house photographer for the Royal Albert Hall. And I always follow that with the Royal Albert Hall, as in the Beatles songs. <laughs> Right. Do you ever walk when I was in London, my wife and I were in London last year and you and Patrick took us on a tour of, of Royal Albert Hall. And I, I, I don't think I understood the majesty of that building until I walked in. Does, mm. does it still do that to you? 
Um, yes, actually it does. Um, I especially, there's this very funny feeling I get when I go on stage, when I have to be on stage. I, I always have this moment like all these great people have stood here on this stage. I mean, people from uh, Cassius Clay to Tina Turner to Frank Sinatra, they all stood on that stage and little old me is standing now on that stage where all those great people were. It still has that effect on me. It, it, it's, yeah. I didn't realize kind of the shape of it, how vertical the walls inside are. They're not tiered like many you know, American U.S. stadiums are. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The pictures that you've taken have ended up on CDs and books and merchandise and calendars. And I mean, literally a little bit of everything. And some of the people that you've worked for, I mentioned Katy Perry. I'm not going to mention today, today's artist yet. Um, Katy Perry, Taylor Swift, One Direction, Paul McCartney, Rod Stewart. One of my favorite artists that I shot last year for the first time is somebody that you've done tours with um, or done shows with is Joe Bonamassa. I had mm -hmm. no idea how fun he is to photograph live. Mm -hmm. and he's coming back in another month or so here to Southern California. Really mm -hmm. excited to, to do that again. But then there's today's artist. And, and part of the reason I want to have you on today is not only to, to we're going to do the normal behind the shot. We're going to look at a shot. We're going to dissect it, dive in deep. But it's one of the images from your new book. So Christy has released a book called Ed Sheeran, Memories We Made. And... It's available in the U.S. This show will, we're, we're recording this in October, but this show will release on uh, Thursday, the 8th of November, two days after this book goes live in the U.S. On, on November 6th, Tuesday, November 6th, you can buy this book on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or whatever in the U.S. But it's available throughout the world now. It's being released country by country. And I happen to have, let me get it on camera, one of the U.K. copies, right? And there's a couple things I want to talk about about this book. First of all, my understanding when I talk to you about the book is this is not what I thought it was going to be. I pictured your typical rock and roll photo book, pictures of Ed Sheeran, page after page of pictures of Ed Sheeran. And as a live music photographer and fan, uh, I would have loved that. And I knew that Ed's dad participated in making the book and wrote the foreword. But here's a key thing I want people to understand. Ed didn't, uh, John didn't just write, John Sheeran didn't just write the foreword. Throughout the book, he gives quotes of why he loves a specific shot for his son. That, that's magic. And then you tell stories about meeting Ed for the first time and the first shoot and that Patrick did the first portrait shots. Um, <laughs> tell me how this came about. Well, um, it was Patrick's dream for a long time to basically actually to make a coffee table book of my pictures. And, you know, I don't look back on my pictures. I look forward. So he kept going on about it and he would be pitching it to people. And at a certain point, we met uh, my now agent, Carrie, and she looked in my library and she said, a cheer would be a book we could make. And I wasn't sold on the idea because, first of all, a Sheeran, brilliant as he is, he's a very static performer. You don't have the same than if you would do a, a photo book of Katy Perry. It's it's completely different. Right. This is just a guy with a guitar. Um, so I didn't really see it. And I also didn't want to jump on the fame of Ed and just abuse that. So I wasn't sold on the idea. But then they put my <laughs> archive in front of me. And then I saw actually that I started shooting him as a 17 year old and gradually over my pictures, you see him growing up, but you don't just see him growing up. You see the stages becoming bigger, the crowds right. becoming bigger. And there was a story. And so I said, and um, I said, okay, a book. Okay. But I want to tell the story as well, because there was actually a story. And then of course, choosing pictures, that's not my forte because I don't, you know, you're, I'm not very good at looking at them. You and I have had this conversation. You oh, are, yeah, yeah. You're a fan of your own work, but you're not one to, to not. tout mm -hmm. your own work, right? You like the pictures yeah. that you make, but you don't. Yeah. yeah. And yet, to me, I mean this seriously. 
you're one of the best music photographers on the planet and this book shows it and you're right about the story because when you start with that first those first portrait sessions and live sessions mm -hmm. and you see you see ed change his hair change his mm -hmm. demeanor you can almost see his eyes change right you mm -hmm. see his tattoos mm -hmm. change i know i love that i love the the whole because Whatever happens in the future, how big he becomes, it doesn't matter. The first decade, the first 10 years will always be his beginning. That never changes. That will always be important, no matter where he goes. And the, the aim of the book, and I said that to John as well, is that my aim is actually that one day Ed can sit with his kids and go back to the beginning and tell them the story of how he began. And that's why I did the book. And that's actually why I told those stories. But I had to have John help me uh, select uh, the picture. So he really, he basically See, did And that was another work. thing I didn't realize that mm -hmm. I found fascinating. And there's a picture in the book of you sitting with John mm -hmm. culling mm -hmm. actual large prints. So you mm -hmm. printed each a uh, bunch of pictures out to sort them rather than sort through them on a computer. Mm hmm yeah, and uh, he had all the pictures on his computer as well. And he's he's a critic. He's um, he does this for a living. He's he he works with artists, with sculptors, with painters. He he does that for a living. So he has a very good eye. He knows what works, what doesn't work. He knows how to compose a book and stuff like that. And I learned so much, so much of just sitting with him and listening and to him dissecting my pictures and making me see things in it that I had never seen before. It was like a wonder to was me. Was that uncomfortable that, though? Well, I thought it would be. That was very strange. I was actually very, very nervous because I know, I know how, you know, I don't like people looking at my pictures. I don't like talking about it. And there I would sit with somebody critiquing my work and I thought this is going to be insufferable. No, I enjoyed it. I so enjoyed it. And I really? learned so much. I was, I was, yeah, I was like a little kid in school again, listening to the teacher, how, how things were. And, and it, sometimes it became uncomfortable because, you know, he would sometimes go like, oh, this picture is like a Machiavelli. And I thought like, oh, cringe. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> let's move on. But it was very constructive criticism. And he knows his son so well. He also knows you know, the, the certain poses that are important for him. He knows all the equipment he uses, which helped me as well, because I had no idea about those things. So it was, and it was never, the intention was, I've always asked him, will you write a foreword? He said, fine, I'll do that. And as I was composing the book, and I sent him, I, I did send him uh, everything I wrote, so he could go over it if he was fine with it. And he said, you know what, I'll send, I'll write some captions as well. It just came organically. Oh, so that was, so the that. intention was originally just the forward. Mm -hmm. His yep. captions, first of all, ah, there's so many places I want to go with this. <laughs> so first of all, his captions, the people listening to the audio version of this can't see the fact that I'm thinking as I go totally silent. Um, his captions bring <laughs> pictures to life. Right. Yeah. His, yeah. He describes not a photograph. He describes his son through mm -hmm. a photograph, which mm -hmm. which is almost a three dimensional image right there. Right. And then, you know, you're a talented photographer and you're witty and, 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 and a smart woman. And, and sometimes I, you know, I, I used to say people with talent tend to have talent in multiple areas that sometimes that they don't even know your writing style is like you speak. It's very endearing, very witty, very fun. And I, I kid you not, as I started reading this book, I suddenly looked up, I'm on page 90 or something like that. I started it late and suddenly it's four o'clock in the morning and I hadn't put it down. Um, so let's, let's jump into a couple of things and then I want to get into this shot. Mm hmm. So first of all, I don't want to spoil story number one because story number one to me was magic, right? Mm -hmm. Let's just say that for, for various reasons, Patrick ended up doing the portrait sessions instead of you. Mm -hmm. You ended up shooting the first show that you shot with Ed mm -hmm. and the power went out. 
That's all mm-hmm. I want to say on that subject. Mm-hmm. Because what happened next and the way you describe that, that you thought the night was over mm. and it wasn't. Everybody thought that. Is that, my friend, is a story, right? And that sets the tone of the book that that's the first thing that happened in your experience with Ed Sheeran. <laughs> So yeah. let's move on to to something else. But I'm just going to tell people, buy the book for that story alone. Seriously. And by yeah. the way, uh, it comes out in November in the U.S. It's a good good Christmas gift. I don't mean to sound like a commercial, but I'm serious. I have the U.K. copy, and I actually have already myself pre-ordered a U.S. copy. Um, that's how much I enjoyed this book. I'm probably going to give it away as a gift to a, to a family member. So on page 95, you said something. And I'm saying pages so that people can refer back to them when they get it. Oh, yeah. You were shooting in the loading dock of an arena and you Mm -hmm. asked Ed to walk away. But whenever you called his name, he was supposed to not turn back, but look back over his shoulder. And you said this and I'm quoting here. It's very important to shoot movement because the facial expression will be completely different from that in a still pose. That sentence is brilliant. Was that something you learned or stumbled on, or how do you? That's my education, yeah. Um, uh, in that, I mean, we could do another podcast on what I learned in school, but um, one of the things is you, when you move, you basically, okay, when you pose, you have full control of, well, you should have full control over what you do. You, you know, you make sure you're, sitting up red straight and and right you right. know you know opening your, you know you think about these things but when you're moving you don't have control over that and the more natural look sometimes good sometimes bad but the more natural look comes actually alive then so that's why i don't like static uh, portrait shoots because it's it's not real it's all too forced and the subject is cramped and you are cramped and it's all but once you make them move or you pull their focus away from what they're doing, natural person comes alive. And that's what I want to capture them. And that's so the that's hard why. part, though, is when they know they're being photographed, there's always that, yeah, they're moving, but it's still an unnatural move, right? Where do you, What do yeah. they do with their hands? The fact that yeah. you just had him walk and look back, I'm stealing that. Yeah. That's so good. <laughs> um, page 205, you talk about your editing. <laughs> And I have to know this. You said mm-hmm. during editing, you have one song on, on repeat. Mm-hmm. Seriously? Yeah. yeah. A yeah. certain I, song oh, or a song by that artist or? Yeah. Uh, well, it depends on the mood. Um, <laughs> if I'm in an angry mood and everything is a little bit, you know, more aggressive, I'll put something lively. But it has to be the same because I don't want the music to distract me. But I need to yeah that repetit and and it plays i mean i can be editing for four hours it will be four hours the same song and i don't get tired of it it's just like background noise for me but which is why it has to be the same song because after the first time playing you can you can kind of uh, start ignoring Mm -hmm. it Mm -hmm. interesting idea i may have to try that except i edit with my wife sleeping next door at you know like last night i sent you an email and patrick answered back going shouldn't you be in bed right now um i know Page 221, which is the end of the book. <clears throat> you mm-hmm. actually talk about why you continue to do this after seeing mm-hmm. the inside, you know, the old saying, once you see how the sausage is made, right? Mm-hmm. Once you've seen the inside of this industry, you still choose to do this. And that's another one I'm going to leave to the people to read in the book because it's enlightening. Um, before we get into the image, I, I just... As somebody who cares about you, I just have to tell you, you've done an amazing, amazing, I realize I only have the camera on you because I'm so excited I'm talking, I didn't switch it back. Um, you have done an amazing job with this book. It is <laughs> It is so much, I knew it would be good. It is so much more than I planned. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So let's get to the image. And I want to mm. introduce this image by doing, this is one of the images actually that John Sheeran, Ed's dad, wrote a a snippet about on page 181 and this is what i mean when i say his his uh 
his musings, as it were, kind of bring a depth to the images, right? We see images and the beautiful thing to me about photography is we get to interpret them. In this case, John interprets it for us in the perfect way. And here's what he says, and I'm quoting here. This is an iconic image that sums up everything Ed stands for. He's performing all alone, commanding a vast crowd, with the lights of thousands of mobile phones shining like stars in the night sky. And the brightest star of all, a distant spotlight, illuminates him and casts his long shadow back over the huge stage. It's like poetry. I know, right? He's good, huh? <laughs> yeah, he's, I mean, give the man some props. He can write. I know, I know. I know. He can definitely write. So let's talk about the shot. I'm going to bring the image up here really quick. This is Ed Sheeran, his first show ever at Wembley Stadium. This is the shot, and I love that you picked this because they use it for his tour posters, which is an interesting thing from a music photographer point of view. You've got all that space for text, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in his merchandise. Mm -hmm. I looked up, I think this was this, according to the EXIF data, if it's right, this would have been a 5D Mark III. Would that be right? Oh, it was still the Mark III then, yeah. Okay. yeah. And this was yeah. shot wide. This was shot at mm -hmm. 16 millimeters on a 16 to 35 mm -hmm. 2.8 Mark II. Here's the questions I have for you. One 500th of a second, totally get it, right? I shot Foo Fighters the other night, 500th of a second, 2500 ISO. It was perfect. Except mm -hmm. Foo Fighters moved so fast, my 500th of a second at time kind of bit me in the butt. And mm -hmm. I was wishing I had bumped up the ice actually i think it was at iso 3200 for them you chose an aperture of 4.5 for this was that intentional because mm -hmm. at 16 millimeters even 2.8 it's going to be super super sharp with the depth of field why 4.5 do you know yeah for my shadow because if you do it on 2.8 your shadow won't be as dark as it is now Oh, okay. So in your head, you were you were aware of the shadow. This wasn't just seeing Ed and trying to capture the lights. You wanted that shadow where it is. Okay, here's the few things that I wanted to do. First of all, like John says afterwards, but there in my head, I had this thing. You know, normally if you if you go there and you see a guy standing there at the edge of a stage and the big arena, you would go into that guy so you have him nice full and the arena. But because the stage was so gigantic, I thought it looked so much more imposing. If I stayed, I actually included the stage into the picture. So that's where I started from. And this um, horrible spotlight was constantly moving. It was like, you know, the guy who was handling it wasn't very secure. So it was very hard to get a nice shine. So I did a couple of shots to get it right. But I could feel that I had to push up my aperture because otherwise I would never have had... An, and, and that was the importance because with that long shadow, you actually put your eye to the size of the stage. If you just leave that messy, then the stage isn't that important. It will... The story of the stage will disappear. I wanted the stage to be important part of my story. So that's why I had to push up the aperture so I have a very dark shadow. Now, the lights, as you well know, those uh, mobile phone lights, you have no control over that. And throughout the show, you have like pockets of lights that went out and then went on again. And I knew I had to just wait for the moment that it was kind of evenly that it's that you have like a nice band of light. But then I had to have my spotlight. So that took actually two songs to get that shot. But I was after that shot because his manager had told me, you know, we want one shot that represents him doing this. But it has to have a long life. It has to have something that we can use in the future, in years to come. And I thought, you know, I have to show the importance of him being alone on a big stage. Also the crowd, it has to be perfect. So I really took my time. I waited until I had 
sort of I saw the lights coming up again because it's you know not everybody sometimes they start dancing and the lights go down again so I waited for that real moment that all the lights were kind of evenly the spotlight was right then I had my shadow and then I took the picture well and the spotlight I mean the odds of his hand being where it is in relation to that spotlight is a crapshoot that's an accident that's an accident because that That I mean and and the other thing is Ed for those of you listening on the audio, uh, still the, the video version of this podcast is still most popular, but there is an audio feed. Go look at the image on the website, BehindTheShot.tv, and find find the blog post for this. Because Ed is actually very small in this. He's smaller than his shadow. And yet, you can clearly see him because the way he's lit, but his hand is almost like holding the spotlight up. Oh, by the way, I also love the stadium lights are, are lightly on. Mm. And that's also just brilliant you said something to me when we picked this image you said this image highlights various components of a good image and Mm. you named the four of them patience sense of Mm. rhythm composition good luck Mm. i i think i understand why this image defines patience because you had to wait it took you two songs to get it Mm. what do you mean by sense of sense of rhythm sense of rhythm is because depending on what he's doing and singing lights move the spotlight moves um he moves so you have to be in the song and know exactly you know go with the rhythm with him and so you know oh at this point in time that spotlight is going to come back those lights are going back on okay next round when that happens again i might have my shot and you have to have that rhythm in you that you know exactly okay now it's going to happen now everything is going to come together now we can try again and then hope that those the the third one was composition yeah so i see rule of thirds all over this Mm. is that kind of what you mean by composition is that you you follow that rule of thirds i'm I'm a little i have this little um i'm very very uh picky about lines and that's also my education, you know, the right. lines and where they end and where they begin and how a picture shouldn't like be overcomposed and there has to be breathing space and there has to be a story to it. And yeah, that's all composition. And then obviously the last one being good luck. Luck. That's the hand that I didn't foresee. That just happened. Interesting. So let uh, uh, this is such a beautiful shot i know why they're and and this is truly an iconic kind of tour photo i mean even you know that right i mean we've all seen them that's the iconic poster where you can picture the text to the left i'm curious generically right you're going out to shoot a show whether it be o2 or or royal albert hall or whatever um you take your camera, you format your card, you put a lens on whatever lens you're going to start with, and you set some settings to walk into the pit to start. What does your camera start at? Obviously, you're going to change the heck out of it during a show. What do you start mm. at? Oh, um, I usually start at 2500 uh, ISO because then I can play with my aperture. I usually start at 2.8, but that never lasts long. Um, and the speed no that that i don't even think about that that just happens you know as soon as i walk into the pit and i see what's happening and what the light is happening then the first thing i think is about my aperture where i'm going with that so you I, might set five you might look at it as a moving artist and do 500th of a second and from that point forward you don't change that usually you just play with your aperture to to adjust exposure yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. interesting Unless, Unless it's like uh, something that's l- very fast moving, then I might ch- change my speed, of course, to get more um, the impact. So there is a little bit of chasing the exposure. You don't set settings and then just wait for the same light. You adjust to shoot. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. What is your normal workflow? When you shoot a show and you go back and you pull the memory card out and you put the memory card in your card reader, mm-hmm. What what what's your normal workflow for importing and editing? Um, well, first of all, after a show, I will always immediately sec- select pictures because I'm still in that trance of the show. 
Um, so I will immediately upload my pictures and I go over the pictures, but very fast. Um, also something I learned in school. Oh my God, I'm, I never talked so much about school. Um, and I go very fast. It's basically click, 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 click until it has to basically, something has to catch my attention and then it stays in. And otherwise it's, I'm just on the delete button. I love the delete button. And I go very fast on the delete button. Delete, 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 so, delete, delete. And what are you doing this in? What are you, what are you calling them in? In iPhoto. Is that iPhoto? You what mean Lightroom? No, no, iPhoto. The oh. old version from oh, way back. Oh, 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 the old that. Apple iPhoto. I got you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then once you have made your selects, mm -hmm. what do you use for to edit? Lightroom. Lightroom? Only Lightroom? Okay. No Photoshop. Mm -hmm. No, no. Oh. <laughs> That's against my religion. <laughs> Watch the video version, trust me. Um, on a shot like this, I don't know how close this was out of camera to what we see. On a shot like this image that we're talking about today, what would you have done to this? Um, actually, I should have a look at the picture again, just to make sure. Uh, the only thing I'm going to do there is probably add some contrast um maybe some black and add some white for the lights so they come out a little bit brighter but that's it do you that's i it. do you eye drop to get a white balance or no no i don't do those things what's that <laughs> yeah okay because mm -hmm. you know one of the things i love about your images is because you know i, I hear so many people almost treat this bizarre image competition thing. Oh, you can't have any clipped blacks. You can't have any blown highlights. It's like, you know what? It's a concert stage where a mm. lighting director is pushing the limits of the human eye. Mm. And part of the way that you convey the dynamic light is mm. leaving some of those specular highlights and leaving mm. some of those pitch dark blacks in. That's what makes you feel like you're in the room. Yeah, of course. It, it's, it's part of the scene. It, no, I think that belongs on a picture. Yeah, I, I completely agree. So your book, and again, mm -hmm. let me just let me just pull it up here really quick. This is that's the back of the book. This is Ed <laughs> Sheeran, Memories We Made. It's a different cover for the yeah, U.S. version than the U.K. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, just such a beautiful book. And you know, you gave me some other images that from the book, I just want to kind of go through. There's this wonderful black and white kind of side shot where it's mostly just Ed's face. Um, again, that's the composition to me on that one. It's it's just mm. so dramatic. The mm. shot of Ed in the Fender t-shirt, you mm. know, singing straight at the camera. And again, the yeah. black and white here just really makes it with Ed. The portrait shot of Ed sitting with his arms on his knees yeah. and his shoes untied, like a 17-year-old yeah. kid would have, yeah. kind of defines you know the, the time frame in Ed's life. And then you've got stuff like the shot of Ed walking up the ramp onto a very, very large stage with nothing yeah. but one guy behind him and a guitar, which that, this actually is an interesting one to me because you can see the, the stadium arena mm -hmm. in, in the background mm -hmm. and how bright mm -hmm. it is outside and it's daylight and he's walking up this ramp and you realize this is one guy, mm -hmm. right? In this, in this vast sea. And the whole, day, well, the two days before, he was not nervous at all. I did even ask him, he said, no nerves whatsoever, yet he always said. But he wasn't nervous when he was down the ramp. But just I was waiting on top of the ramp for him to walk in. And just at that moment, I could feel the tension running. You, you could just feel the energy. That's where it hit him, I think. Just when he came above that and he saw the crowd, reality hit him. But then the braveness. He for a minute stopped, he looked, and he went straight to the front of the stage and started playing. That's what makes a star and the same show, the shot of him looking over at Elton John, 
mm. on the piano. Mm. And I think there's a story in the book where he had gone to see Elton John when he was a kid. Mm. Um, there's just such magic in this book. The, the picture of way up above shooting down on top and there's a spotlight mm. hitting Ed. Where are you mm. in that shot? <laughs> I'm next to the organ in the Royal Albert Hall. It's my secret hiding place. Like up multiple floors? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, you know the organ oh, yeah. of the Albert Hall. Yeah. So there's a little balcony on the bottom. So sometimes I crawl on that. What a, I box. mean, just amazing. And the last one I've got up is the cover of the UK book. But again, it'll be different in the US. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't even know where to start other than to sound like I'm gushing. It's just, it's yeah. a beautiful book, young lady. It's a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful book. And I love the image. Thank you so very, very much. So again, what day does the book come out in the US? 6th of November. 6th of November, which is a Tuesday. It's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. But here's what I'm going to do. Rather than you try and figure out where to go, I think I've got a direct Amazon link in the blog post. But also I have a link to Christy's website. She has an entire page set up. Whatever country you're watching this in. She has a page listing the countries, listing the release dates for those countries and links to buy the books in those countries. And a link to that page will be in the blog post at behindtheshot.tv. But her website, which is easy to get to the link yourself if you want to, is christygoodwin.com. So Christy, let's just kind of run down your stuff really quick. You've got christygoodwin.com is your normal website, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. What can people find there? Your portfolio? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Port everything I do. Yeah, I okay. suppose. Okay, portfolio, so. <laughs> book link, stuff like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. on Facebook, Christy Goodwin Photography. Yes. Okay. And then Twitter and Instagram make it really, really easy. They're the same. You are Christy Goodwin, Christy Goodwin on either one of those. So again, Christy, yeah. thank you so much. No, thank you for having me. And thank you for being so nice with my book. <laughs> oh, I'm serious. It's... I looked at my wife, you know, Deb, I looked at Deb and went, you've, you've got to read it. You've got to read it right away. How come you haven't read it yet? So now she's got markers in here now too. Um, <laughs> it's just people, it's it's that freaking good. So again, I got to say thank you very, very much to my friend Christy Goodwin for coming and being on Behind the Shot. Uh, there will be a blog post, BehindTheShot.tv, associated with this episode. The book, Ed Sheeran, Memories We Made, comes out around the world on different dates, but in the U.S. on Tuesday, November 6th. If you want to follow me, you can find me on uh, Facebook at Steve Brazel Photography. On Instagram and Twitter, it's really easy. It's just Steve Brazel. And Brazel is like Brazil, but two L's. That makes it easy for you. And then if you want to hit any of the websites, of course, as I say, it's BehindTheShot.tv or you can go to stevebrazel.com. Again, drop us an iTunes review. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast. And if you just search, you could end up finding the old link, which does an update. Make sure you go to the website behindtheshot.tv and get the links for your podcast subscriptions there. That'll make it a little bit easier for you. Again, this is Behind the Shot, the show where we try and get inside the mind of great photographers by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. I'm Steve Brazel. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you.